So push it. Push race it. We can tell we're in the mid-digital age because we see the kind of greasy fingerprints of disappointment. Uh, we see small children going up to every screen uh, and then sort of going, huh? Um, I'm going to be miserable to start with, and then I'm going to get really happy and optimistic towards the end. Um, but I think we're in this thing called the mid-digital age, which is this kind of shitty interim before life gets good and after life was good. Um, and we just have like all this complexity everywhere. You know, you go into some restaurants and they only take cards, and then a, a bit later you go into some restaurants and they only take cash. And sometimes you have to do a chip and a pin, or a chip and a pin and a sign, or a wave. And it's just all really complicated. Um, we have ad blockers, and then we have ad block blockers, and then ad block 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 blockers, or whatever that is, because we haven't quite figured out how to make money in the right kind of way. Like, we're still quite new to all this stuff. Um, we have this sort of amazing mental burden where you have to remember, like, incredibly complicated passwords. And, like, it's normally the sites that you care about least that have the most complicated passwords. And then the one where, like, all of your money in, it's just, like, your mother's maiden name. Um, and it's like, can't I just use my fingerprint or my face or something like that? Uh, we've got these crazy choices. Like, I don't think it's quite as bad in Australia as it is in the US. But if you just really, really, really love Breaking Bad or um, West Wing, you have to sort of remember, like, which remote control is it first, um, which is a terrible way to think about TV. Like, imagine if you could only navigate music by, like, the record label that produced it first. Um, like, it's a really sort of messy, sort of shitty... I think I'm, I can swear because it's Australia. Um, I'll get worse as time goes on. It's a really messy, shitty situation. Um, like, we leave a lot of money on the table because we haven't quite figured out how to do the plumbing yet. So whether it's things like rights management for TV uh, or whether it's just organizational complexity, like, we're not doing it all very well. Uh, it's quite dumb. You know, what do we want, chatbots? When do we want them? Sorry, I didn't quite understand your request. Um, like, chatbots go from being the most exciting thing we've ever seen uh, to, uh, oh, um, in about sort of 10 seconds, normally. But that doesn't stop us being excited. So whether it's the blue screen of death that you see everywhere around you, um, whether it's things that don't talk to each other, you know, we worry about computers getting self-aware and killing us. Like, I'll worry about that when my laptop is aware of my printer. <laughs> like, when, <laughs> when my fucking light switch can talk to a light bulb, then I'll get worried. But <laughs> until then, I think we're going to be fine. Uh, technology is a word that describes something that doesn't yet work uh, by Douglas Adams. I think there's a lot of technology today. I think we really notice it. And we notice it all the time because we are aware of all these problems around us. Uh, and that is the mid-digital age. So I'm going to give you 10 themes to um, inspire or get you to think sort of slightly differently. Uh, the first one is it's about people, not technology, which again, I'm not the first person to say this today. But we tend to assume that solutions are about technology. We tend to get briefs which are, what can we do with a chat bot, or what does an Apple Watch app look like? It's much better to think, how can I create a better customer experience? You know, maybe the solution to a hotel's customer service problem is not to have a robot that goes down the corridors. Maybe it's not to have a smart watch app which allows you to unlock the, what, the doors with your, phone, with your watch. Maybe it's to have an Apple phone charger in the room. Like maybe it's to have light switches that you understand which light they're going to turn on. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one that you can't turn off. You're like, I'm just going to have to smash this one. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> but it's about people. It's about empathy. And then know that technology exists, but it's about people. And then the second point here is no one has time for anything anymore. You know, again, I can give you all the data and lots of graphs, and it makes me look really proper. Um, but we don't have time. Like, we haven't been bored since about 2003. Like, we, we don't have time to see our best friend's wedding pictures. There are Oscar-winning films we've not seen. 
And somehow we think that user-generated content of, of haircuts or you know, behind-the-scenes footage of behind-the-scenes of some third-rate concert is extra stuff that's worth something. Like, we spend our whole lives trying to get by in a day. We spend our whole lives like, trying to make sure that our kids don't kill each other. We spend our whole lives worrying about stuff. I don't think we have as much time as we all presume that we have. Um, which is fine, because it creates an opportunity. Um, there is no line. Um, this is my dad. He's surprisingly old. Uh, he's 70. He lives in a small village. But he uses the internet a lot. So if you ask him how much time he spends online, he says about four hours a day. Uh, this is my sister. She's younger. If you ask her how much time she spends online a day, she says about five hours. If you ask a 14-year-old how much time they spend online, they say, what? Because for a 14-year-old, there is no online, there is no offline, there is just the modern world. Um, we don't know how much time we spend with electricity per day. Like, you don't think about electricity as being a thing. You don't do electrical shopping, you don't do electrical banking, you don't do electrical dating, or maybe that's like a really weird thing. Um, <laughs> But yet, we're obsessed with this line. Like, we're talking about e-commerce. Like, people are just buying stuff. Like, they don't care how it gets to them. Like, we remember the internet. Oh, I did the wrong thing. Like, if, you look at, um, if you look at how people use technology in foreign countries, um, you know, Asia, um, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Myanmar, more people use Facebook than use the internet. Um, now, it's easy to sort of laugh and be like, oh, they just don't get it. It just means they don't care. Like their relationship is with Facebook, not with like the weird concept of data that comes to them through, you know, servers and stuff like that. So they're probably more correct in how they think about it than us. Because this is how we remember the internet. We remember the internet of going online, of surfing the web. You'd wait for your flatmate to get off the phone. You'd unplug something, plug something else in, click on an icon, click on another item, wait for the scratchy music, do the thing you wanted to do, and then we'd get offline. Like, the world of the internet today is extremely transformative, but also very boring. So to have a digital strategy, and to have a head of digital, and to have a department called digital, and to think that video is somehow miraculously different to TV, personally, I find that quite unhelpful. I understand why it might exist now, but it's not a particularly helpful way to think about things moving forward. Um, we're also starting to see much more interesting bridging between the two. So actually, when you sort of think about the world, it's much better to think about the physical and the virtual as being this sort of hybrid, meshed world where sort of journeys go between the two. Like, if you check your email when you're grocery shopping, it, like, that doesn't seem like a very advanced form of this, but it's the same thing, where kind of what's real and what's not blend. And we'll probably see more technology that, that creates these bridges between the two. So whether it's kind of geo-placed advertising that pops up in certain places, whether it's things like AR kit from Apple, which creates augmented reality, uh, whether it's QR codes, which are now embedded uh, as a scanner within iOS 11, they're now embedded within Google Chrome, we'll start to see this behavior a lot more where just things will kind of come to life in this sort of curious space between the two. Now, QR codes, you feel quite embarrassed talking about them because they're really lame. Um, but if nothing else, they're extremely popular in China. And as, just as a mental construct to think, how can this price tag take me to more information online? How can this, um, you know, the terms and conditions for my um, pharmaceutical product actually exi exist online instead? It's a really, really sort of interesting thing to think about. Number three of 10, intimate screens and data. If I got you all to unlock your phones and pass it to the person next to you, you'd freak out after about 10 seconds. Uh, and that's because these are the most personal devices we've ever known. Uh, they know absolutely everything about us. They know more than anything that's ever existed and more than anyone we know. Generally speaking, over time, media has got more personal and more immersive. We've gone from cinemas to TVs to laptops to phones. Generally, what we've done is we've taken the ad units of the past, and as things have got smaller, and as the sounds got a bit less likely to appear, um, we've made the ad units smaller, and we've removed the sound. 
it would actually be extremely interesting to work the other way and to sort of think, right, this device knows where I am. It has gyroscopic sensors, which means as I rotate the phone, images can come to life. It knows what I'm planning on doing later on. It knows what the weather conditions are right now. It knows how the stock market's performing right now. It's actually an incredible canvas to work around. Uh, the second point here is much more intimate data. Like most data is actually completely unhelpful. We have far too much of it. Uh, data is about making decisions. And the best thing about these devices is you now have the most intimate and most personal and most useful data when it comes to targeting and when it comes to helping people. Now, when I have longer to speak, I love talking about privacy and I love talking about future attitudes towards privacy. Um, and genuinely, I never really have time to have that conversation. But I'd love us as an industry to start getting better, uh, earning people's trust and giving people value in exchange uh, for knowing more about them. Number four, um, the concept of TV is quite strange. Like, no one can really decide what TV is anymore. Is it like a content quality? Is it a content length? Is it a delivery mechanism? Like, the devices in our life used to be very, very different to each other. And actually, now they're basically the same thing. They're all essentially black rectangles um, of the same sort of um, ratio. And they're all connected to the internet, and they all play video. Um, so it's very interesting to think what the future of media will be. It probably won't be buying things by media channel, but instead thinking of contexts to convey messages in. The context of sitting back and enjoying something, the context of looking for something, the context of being out and about. Um, it's extremely interesting to think how with personal data, and with much more uh, personalization, how we can sort of move people down the, the purchase funnel based on their behavior on different devices. Number five, um, Australia is pretty much in the same place in technology as most of the rest of the world. You used to think that you were behind. Now you're kind of the same and in some ways ahead. The only thing you're behind on is, for some reason, Jeff Bezos seems to hate Australia. <laughs> so you don't get things like the Amazon Echo here as quickly. Uh, but I've been trying these devices for a long time. And they're not necessarily as exciting as people think they are. There is this presumption that voice interfaces are the future, that I will ask my Alexa to order me some bread. It's a really crappy experience. If you're trying to order some, I think you say nappies. Do you say nappies or diapers? If you try and order that, uh, through Alexa, it spends about five minutes telling you about nappies. That's not a particularly sensible way to buy nappies. Um, voice will be a fantastic operating system. It will be a really interesting glue. It will be wonderful in the car. Um, but it's not necessarily going to be the destroyer of all brands. It becomes a very interesting thing to think about. And it becomes a very interesting thing to try but I don't think the voice is necessarily the future. There are other interactions which, for me, are much more exciting. So the Tinder-like interface of swiping to the left and swiping to the right, ways to make user interfaces that are predictive and personalized is extremely exciting. Things like augmented reality, things like magic leap and mixed reality. There are lots of really interesting things in the medium-term future here. But for the moment, um, I think we need to be quite cautious about them. Um, this was mentioned before by Bessie. Um, I'm amazed at how the entire world, other than China, doesn't get instant messaging. Um, as marketers, we hope for the day that we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with people. And generally speaking, when people answer back to us, we tend to ignore them. Like Most of the time, if you ever tweet at a brand, they will either won't reply to you or will give you a phone number to speak to them on. Like instant messaging is probably the most exciting thing in marketing. The ability to text a restaurant and find out if they're open, the ability to text a hotel and find out you know, how much rooms are going to be, the ability to speak to your airline and change your flight. Like instant messaging is an extremely interesting thing to work around. And going back to the digital transformation thing before, like most companies aren't able to deal with this yet because they're not constructed to be able to do this. But if we could find a way to sort of embed this kind of thinking deep within companies, it gets extremely interesting. Uh, the storefront is now everywhere. This isn't the, the sort of deepest chapter. But we just need to be aware that every single surface in our life 
is now a place you can buy something from. Whether it's a QR code that you might scan on outdoor media, whether it's a digital billboard that you might be able to touch, whether it's your phone itself, like the world is now essentially the biggest store. And also, inventory is now pretty much unlimited. Like retailers used to be limited by the stock that they could keep, which would be limited by the physical space they had to keep stuff. As you can see in the world of eBay or Alibaba or Amazon, you don't necessarily need to sell stuff that you have. So we need to completely consider, reconsider who can be a retailer and what they can sell. There's no reason if you have two, if you have two billion users like Facebook, you couldn't actually become the biggest store overnight. Uh, building on that, um, and the purchase funnel can now just be a swipe or a press. Um, you know, we tend to assume that there is a purchase funnel and it goes from aware to like to prefer to find. Pretty much everything that you now see in the world, you could buy just with a tap of your finger, um, especially things like Touch ID. So I'd love to see every single company get a lot better at extracting money from people. We tend to do a really good job of creating really good products that are worth the time to find them and buy them. It would be amazing if we could just make things that are so easy to buy that people don't even remember that they've done it. Um, I got a text message. It's a tiny thing. I got a text message from my mobile operator yesterday saying, you've run out of data. You won't have any more for six hours. I don't know why that message didn't say, for $20 extra, just press here, and we'll give you data for the rest of the day. We, we tend to sort of not make it easy to spend money sometimes. Um, number nine, and it's sort of building on that, we're getting the bifurcation of commerce. Basically, shopping is going extreme. Either we're creating amazing experiences that are the kind of metaphorical equivalent of a Saturday shopping with your friends where you try things on and you have a great time, or we're trying to remove all of the experience altogether. Like the, the movement towards flagships and the kind of Apple Store experience and things like Nike Tech Book, which is a really amazing app, that you, which is basically content you can buy from, they're really good examples of shopping. Shopping is making something so good that if you're bored, you might decide to go there and buy something. It's entertainment. The opposite is buying. Buying is basically making sure that someone owns something without thinking about it. It's the complete removal of any experience. It's making it incredibly easy. And it's competing mainly on simplicity. Like No one has ever been so bored they went to the Amazon search bar and just started typing in random things they might buy. Um, it's a, like For most companies, most places, it actually seems to me that buying is probably the right uh, sort of behavior to optimize around. Like, how can you make it so easy that people won't even think twice about it? And companies don't do this very well. Like, I'm amazed at how few companies integrate PayPal. I'm amazed at how few companies integrate Touch ID. I'm amazed at how, companies, how few companies integrate Amazon Pay or Samsung Pay. We really need to just make sure um, that we're empathetic about people's lack of time. The tenth one is digital disappointment. Uh, you may think you are in your industry. You may think that if you are a bank, you are competing with other banks. And as long as your website is as good as other banks, you are fine. You might think that if you make cars, then your touch interface has to be as good as other cars. Increasingly, our experiences are shaped by the best-in-class experience we see anywhere in the entire world. So when Uber can tell you where the driver is in real time, what their name is, how many stars they've got, and you can message them, it then seems very strange when your cable company can't tell you anything about when the person's due to arrive. Um, when you have a company like Venmo that allows you to make payments to each other free of charge and immediately, um, it seems odd when your bank is going to charge three day, uh, take three days to do the payment. So, in all of our jobs, it's absolutely essential that we spend all of our time looking far and wide and seeing all of the best-in-class experiences across all experiences because, effectively, that becomes our customer comparison mindset. And most of the time, it leads to disappointment. So when you check into a Delta flight and it tells you when it's boarding, you then get annoyed when the American Airlines don't tell you the same thing. 
Um, so we really need to think about this. The last one, and it's a bonus one, it's, it's you know, your 10% extra free, is AI. Um, and I've called it the 11th one because I don't really know what to say about it. Um, lots and lots of people claim to understand AI. Lots of people claim that their company is AI. I know enough about it to know that I don't know that much to talk about. But I would say that most of the things that people express are the future of business because of AI are actually wrong. I don't think the image recognition that tells you that a dog is a dog is going to change the future of advertising. I don't think that necessarily buying against very precise weather conditions because IBM Watson can do it is necessarily going to transform your suit brand. I actually think that AI is probably going to be the next equivalent of electricity. So it's going to be companies that completely rebuild themselves and completely change all of their processes and completely change all of their structure and their staff culture. And they work around the potential of AI. I actually think that those could be the next generation of huge companies. So I don't think we should be sprinkling a bit of AI on to get a press release. I think we need to fundamentally, at some point, reconfigure our companies around it. So I think that's kind of my end. Um, I am aware that life feels quite crazy now. I'm aware that our industry, I think, has lost a bit of ambition. I feel like we're sometimes a bit embarrassed to work in advertising. We sometimes hope to kind of tiptoe around privacy. I actually think this is probably the most amazing time to work in advertising. I think technology is creating these new expectations. It's creating incredible opportunities. It, technology is a toolkit. And if you're an artist and you got given the best tools and the best canvas that's ever been known, you would be really, really excited by it. So I'd love collectively for us to spend less time looking at the past, less time trying to emulate Nike ID, less time trying to emulate the Apple 1984 ad, and less time looking at our competitors and going, mm, they did this, maybe we should too. And instead, look ahead. Look at what's possible. Look at what people want and they haven't articulated yet. And I think if we can do that, it's going to be an incredible career for all of us. Yeah.